Jay here, and today I'm building a Torment from the Ashes of Faith box set. I'll be using this Torment model in Necromunda as a Warp Horror Outlaw Brute for my Chaos Helot Cultist Gang. I'll build and paint it, and go over its rules, this time on JD in the Sump Sea. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we really are having a good time making these videos, Dale and I, and thanks a lot for watching them it does mean a lot and it's uh, very cool to be able to give back uh, to the community and to uh, give you guys a little bit of a, a view into what we do here in our Necromunda neck of the woods the ashes of faith box set came with three different models I'm going with the model that has the large fist because I figure with the rules for the Warp Horror, its strength um, of six makes more sense with a giant fist. So we'll go over the rules later in this episode, um, but first um, cutting out the model right here, there's actually a good amount of bits and they're spread across all three of these frames, which seems kind of odd when you first think about it, that each one of these rectangles wouldn't have one Warp Horror on it, but it must make sense for the way that they mold them or the way that they're planning on boxing these models in the future. So anyway, I'm gluing them together and the glue that I use is Loctite gel and I really do like that as super glue and I always use super glue for pretty much everything. I have to use my my knife to trim off the um, the mold lines. Funny story about this model, I'm actually building it the day before I want to play with it for the first time. Um, a few weeks ago when I played this game last, I actually purchased the Warp Horror. I thought it'd be a great addition to this Chaos Cultist gang. I had plenty of credits and I bought it, but I still hadn't assembled the model. So I've actually had it in the works to put this together for quite a while. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's coming together and this whole build took oh probably I don't know 20 minutes didn't take very long to assemble it especially with the accelerator that stuff really does make this drive faster now it didn't come with a Necromunda base but I did buy a bag of bases a while back so I'm using one of these Necromunda bases for its base and I'm, I'm noticing that some of these connection points on the bottom of the model are very tiny, so again, I'm going to use the accelerator. I'm just going to spray the entire base with that accelerator stuff, and then set the model on top of that after I you know, put the glue on the bottom of it. And that should hold it quite nicely together. And it does. And with the, the miracle of editing, uh, we're going right past the, the, um, the base coating phase and into the painting phase. And when I base coated it, I just used a black spray paint. You can get them for quite cheap. I think I usually use Krylon brand. But of course, uh, I didn't quite get every part of the model, so a lot of the undersides of the model are not quite black. They, the, the, the paint didn't quite get there, so I'm just touching everything up with my basic black craft paint, watering it down a little bit, get it in the base, all the nooks and crannies on the base. And one of the things I found that was neat about these miniatures that I didn't realize when I first bought the box set and even saw the previews, I didn't even realize it when I looked at the sprues, was that these torments, what they are, are actual humans. They look like cultists that demons are bursting out of. I do find that actually way more interesting than just a giant uh, mutant or, you know, mutant ogre type thing. A warp monster bursting out of somebody else's body is just way, way cooler and way creepier. So I decided to try and paint the human that it, the monster is being burst out of in a different color than what I do with the monster. So I'm using this pink 
and painting the rest of the the warp monster in this pink color, the, the demon bursting out of him. So regular flesh for the human, and this pink for the demon. Again, my, my process is base coat, then wash. That's generally all I do. Sometimes I'll dry brush after that. All right, so this is a beige color. I'm gonna be painting all of the horns with this beige color. Just to have it stick out a little bit differently from, from the rest of the model. It's different than the pink, it's different than the flesh tone. It's not that different than the flesh tone, and once I do some of these washers, you'll see that it's not super different from the pink, but it it is different enough that it allows it to just stand out just a bit. And then I'm using this green. The green is for the clothing that the Chaos Cultist is wearing. The rest of my Cultist gang is wearing green as well. Green and brown, I believe. Um, and, and gray. And actually, I will be doing another video uh, highlighting that gang. I'll go over each model, you'll see what they look like, and I'll go over the stats and how I built the gang and my, uh, my reason for building them the way that I did. But here we go, I'm just kind of painting. He's got kind of like, I don't know, like, like a half a robe or like a skirt or something that he's wearing. It's just like rags basically at this point. Next, I'm moving on to a red, it's a Mephiston red. And this is going to be for the inside of the demon's mouth. And some other parts on him as well. Figured I'd kind of just smush some of this red around. That's what I do with a lot of this. I'm just kind of take some of these colors and just kind of mush it around on its skin because you want to make it look gross and strange. All right, while that dries, I'm moving over to silver. I use lead belcher. I've mentioned this in other videos, but I really do like lead belcher, how, how dark it is. It, um, I think it really fits the grim dark of the 41st millennium with the, with the dark silver that it is. I usually like to make it even darker by putting a, a null oil wash over it. So what's cool about this model too is that uh, one of the legs actually has this uh, metal spike that's kind of tied to it and then his arm also has like a metal spike tied to it too so it's like these crazy weapons that are tied to his arm that are just like pieces of metal just crazy now I'm already on the base and what I'm doing here with the base and I'm doing this before I'm doing any washing is uh, just kind of putting this orange on the base I guess kind of a heavy dry brush and stuff I kind of had it kind of giving in some of the grooves it's basically to try and make it look a little bit rusty once once it's done Brown is going to be on the leather parts, the straps, strapping the metal rods to his limbs. And there's like a leather strap coming out of his mouth. It's kind of strange. Probably it's something to do with the ritual of bringing the demon to reality or something. So yeah, just using brown for straps. Anything leather, I usually paint brown. Moving on, I'm using a different orange. This is a bit brighter of an orange than the other orange I used, and this one is going to be on his tongue, the demon's tongue. I thought I'd do an orange tongue, just to do something a little bit different. I usually people do like pink or red tongues. I thought I'd do an orange one here. I think it turned out all right. Then I want to pick out his teeth. I always pick out teeth on models like this if I can. And I just use a bright white. This is a white craft paint. Any white acrylic is, is fine for this. This has decent coverage though, this craft paint. So I'm just going to touch each of his teeth with that white. 
All right, and here I'm kind of picking out some other parts that were metal with the lead belcher that I missed before. Some of the chaos icons are probably just metal circles, basically. And then I'm dry brushing the base. And again, this is uh, dry brushing the base over the kind of the orange parts I've already done. This is to make it look like kind of a, an old rusty metal. All right, now we're getting into the fun stuff, doing some washes here. This wash is a flesh wash from Army Painter. I've actually found it to be pretty awesome. I really do like this for a flesh wash. And just straight out of the bottle, it works really well. And I'm putting this just on the, the human cultist skin. I'm not putting it anywhere else. This little mixing tray I actually found at the dollar store. It was like a, I don't know, a bag of like five, I think. For a dollar, it's a pretty good deal. All right, then we're gonna move over to snake bite leather um, contrast paint, mixing it with some lemon and medium, using it as now a wash instead of a contrast. This is something I experimented with in a different video, and I actually really like the contrasts when you add some Lamy and Medium to them and make them into washes. I really think that they work well as that, so here we go. I'm using this over the pink flesh of the demon. I think it really turns out well, and then I'm also putting it on the green robes that he's wearing, the green, the green clothing. And then we're just touching up everything on the demon. Pretty much the whole demon is going to have this wash on him. I'll move on to probably my most fun technical paint that Games Workshop has ever made, and that's Blood for the Blood God. And we're just going to dab this on all over the place, just all over the place, just on the human part, on the demon part, on the, the metal spikes, put some, some of it on the base, like it dripped off of him and is now on, on the floor beneath him. And then I'm just painting the outline of the base, just to make it uniform and match the rest of the bases of the cultist gang that I already have. I actually painted this in about 45 minutes right before I had to go play with it, so once it was done, I put it in front of a fan so it would dry fast. And here's the finished model. In my other video, Necromunda in White Dwarf, issue 458 of White Dwarf, it had rules for outlaw brutes. There were four brutes in the White Dwarf, and they're only available to outlaw gangs. And they're, I believe, all zero to one. And the one that we're going to focus on here is the Warp Horror. Now, as you can see on the, the scanned page here from the White Dwarf, it's 210 credits. Movement of 6 inches, weapon skill 3 plus, ballistic skill 6 plus, strength 6, toughness 4, 3 wounds, a 4 plus initiative, 3 attacks, 9 plus leadership, 6 plus cool, 7 plus willpower, and 9 plus intelligence. It comes with two horrific appendages, and those are the weapons it comes with. Um, the options for it are either Massive Tentacles, Warp Fire Breath, or Undulating Skin. And we'll go over those, all of those options in just a moment. The special rules it has are Terrifying. So, if an enemy fighter wishes to make a fight, basic, or shoot basic action that targets a Warp Horror, they must make a Willpower check. If the check is failed, they cannot perform the action and their action ends immediately. Also note that since the action has not been performed and if the fighter's activation is not ended, they can still attempt to make the same action again, in theory. Now, there also has the rules Warp Denizen. So in the end phase of each round, roll 2d6. If the result is equal to or lower than the current game round, the Warp Horror suffers a flesh wound. As a creature of the Immaterium, a Warp Horror ignores all lasting injury results with the exception of memorable, memorable death. And so basically, the lower the turn number, the, the more chances that it will stick around. As the game goes on, 
there's a higher and higher chance that it'll take a flesh wound each turn and disappear. So one of the upgrade options is undulating skin, and that's 40 credits. If you take that, uh, then it reduces damage by one to a minimum of one. So if it gets hit with a damage two weapon, instead of that weapon doing two damage to it, it would do one damage to it. Pretty decent. It also starts with one skill, and that is the Nerves of Steel skill. It has some skill access as well, primary in ferocity, secondary in brawn and combat. So it starts with horrific appendages, and horrific appendages are a melee weapon. They have pulverize and rending, it's strength as user, AP minus one and two damage. So it starts with those, it starts with two of those. That's how I built mine. I think it's uh, pretty good with that actually. And something you could upgrade it to, it could have the warp fire breath, which is a template weapon, strength 3, AP minus 1, 1 damage, 4 plus ammo, blaze and templates, so it's basically a, you know, basically a flamer you could give him if you want, or you could give him uh, massive tentacles. Now, massive tentacles are actually kind of cool, it's a versatile weapon, has entangle and drag, a 4 inch range, strength plus 1, so be strength 7, and damage 1. So it's like if you give it big tentacles, it could reach out, grab something, and, and drag it, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, those are the options for the Warp Horror, and yeah, I uh, for my model, I bought the Undulating Skin Upgrade, and just kept it with the two horrifying appendages, the two horrific appendages, and it worked pretty well in the game I played with it. It took out two, um, two squats, like almost right away, and made a couple other ones run away, so it did work pretty well in the game I played with it. And uh, I think that it's a good addition to any Chaos Cultist gang as an option instead of instead of trying to hope for spawn, you could use a Warp Horror, and I think they're very fluffy and actually work pretty good in Necromunda. So anyway, thanks for watching.